December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. That was President Franklin Roosevelt addressing Congress after Japan's devastating attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Wednesday marks 75 years since the surprise attack, which immediately drew the U.S. into World War II. Within days, American troops landed in Australia to begin defending the Pacific. Mark Albert takes us to Brisbane, Australia, where famed General Douglas MacArthur made crucial decisions that helped win the war. On the eighth floor of what was once the sturdiest building in downtown Brisbane, echoes of history reverberate off the wood-paneled walls. We're in the actual office of uh, General Douglas MacArthur. This is where he worked. This is where he worked. It For more than half indeed. of World War II, U.S. General Douglas MacArthur ran the Allied fight in the Southwest Pacific from this suite in Australia's third largest city. It's now part of the MacArthur Museum here, John Wright is its executive officer. Do you feel when you walk in here that you're following the footsteps of General MacArthur? There is an aura of history about it. Just 15 days after Pearl Harbor, stunned by the sudden arrival of war, U.S. troops began arriving in Brisbane, the first of an eventual one million who would pass through Australia. In time for the 75th anniversary, the museum has finished restoring the general's office. The bronze door handles returned. The timberwork revived. Why was it important to restore his office to the way that it was? This is a museum which is in a position to actually show the enormous impact that uh, decisions made in that office had on Australia and on the conduct of the war. Why was Australia vulnerable? Well, essentially what was happening is the Japanese were advancing down through the Philippines. Simultaneously, they were moving from French Indochina down through the Malay states into what was then the Dutch East Indies. They were looking to isolate Australia. But when MacArthur arrived in Australia in the spring of 1942, he did not land as a conquering hero. He was forced to flee the Philippines with his family, issuing his famous promise, I shall return, but not for two years. Was he sort of licking his wounds? He was definitely licking his wounds. And Walt Borneman time, wrote the just-released book, MacArthur at War. How does a general on a losing streak go to Australia and by the end of World War II become someone extremely popular throughout the country. MacArthur fills the need in the American psyche for a hero. To MacArthur's credit, by the time 1944 comes along, he's doing a lot of island hopping. He's really bought into the whole concept of, of air power. Uh, he's doing miraculous amphibious landings all over. So he doesn't evolve as a military commander. Three quarters of a century later, 1,250 U.S. Marines are deployed in the northern Australia city of Darwin for training. A sign Australian Army Captain Adele Katz tells CBS This Morning Saturday of an enduring partnership. I think that the collaboration that occurred with uh, U.S. troops in World War II under General MacArthur certainly has laid the groundwork for the U.S. and Australian joint operations that exist now. Today, MacArthur's legacy lives on here in other ways. His old headquarters building has been named after him. There's an Apple store on the ground floor right next to MacArthur Central, a mall. In greater Brisbane, there are streets, roads, drives, circles, and bus stops named after the general who still touches 84-year-old resident Del Hicks. That's Arthur. You can just see Neil there. And this is me. Hicks played with Arthur MacArthur, the general's son, while the family lived in Brisbane. Dear Del, Arthur wants me to send you this little note to tell you how much he has missed you. Jean MacArthur, the general's wife, even sent Hicks a letter after the family left. She's kept it for 71 years. I think what nice people they were. Mrs. MacArthur was a charming woman. And um, I always remember the general had lovely soft hands because one day he took Arthur's hand and my hand and we went down the hall singing his little songs. How many letters did you exchange with MacArthur? Uh, six altogether. Ron Reese says MacArthur gave him this lieutenant's pen when he was just six years old. And this letter, after a chance reunion in New York over tea, 
20 years later, Reese is now a volunteer at the MacArthur Museum. In some small manner of repaying what the United States and uh, our allies, the Australians, did for me. Despite that adoration and his status as one of the most famous generals in U.S. history, MacArthur apparently never let go of certain insecurities. So instead he has George Washington. As John Wright tells us, back inside MacArthur's Brisbane office. Whereas you'd normally expect the U.S. president of the day, Franklin Roosevelt, to be up there, um, he made the comment that uh, he wasn't having any Democrat looking down on him. He was a Republican. And he was a Republican with uh, probably ambitions to the 1944 presidential nomination. MacArthur didn't end up campaigning for president. Instead, on September 2nd, 1945, he accepted Japan's surrender on the deck of the USS Missouri. That day, he famously told the American people in a radio address, We must go forward to preserve in peace what we won in war. For CBS This Morning Saturday, Mark Albert, Brisbane, Australia. Wow, I love that. <laughs> the woman said he had lovely soft, soft. hands. I don't think the general would have been happy about that little piece of I don't trivia. Think maybe he didn't want us to share on the 75th anniversary, but anyway.